When Ursula was leaving, there was no bitterness. She was in a joyful mood. It was just a big adventure, and she wanted to, to have that adventure like so many other country kids did. She told us that she was going to Sydney, and we said, OK. And she was to ring us when she got there to give us the address, but that phone call never came. From the day that she got on that train, there was just no record of Ursula Barwick. We just didn't know where she was. It eats at you all the time because you can't get away from it. You wake up in the middle of the night and you think, what the hell's happened? It's a grief that you can't explain. Is she dead or is she alive? Is she coming home? Is she not? This could have been such an easy case to solve and it could have saved a lot of heartache. It was sitting right there in front of them. It was just there in front of them and they just missed it. They had done their job back then, like they've done now, it would have made our life a lot easier, a lot easier to live with the facts. As a journalist, I've reported on dozens and dozens of missing person cases. I think Ursula's case, unfortunately, highlighted some of the systemic and deep-rooted problems with missing person investigations. I don't think Ursula's case is unique. I think there's a failing all the way through. I think that every single family should be ringing up the New South Wales Police now and saying, please explain. There's 2,600 long-term missing people in Australia. That's a lot of families and that's a lot of people who are affected. You know, there's so many challenges involved with long-term cases, but if we put some dedicated resources onto it, people shouldn't have to go through what we went through. Hey, Deb. How are you doing? Hi, Em. Hi, Sean. Hi, nice to see you. Hey, Sean. Last year in 2018, we had our 30th school uh, reunion in Kurindai. It's a small town in the northwest of New South Wales, but our friend Ursula Barwick wasn't there. It's going to be pretty low key. We'll just wander around, starting on the ground floor, which is still mess. Oh, yeah, okay, it's <laughs> I don't think Ursula would have withstood us having school reunions without coming to them because she was such a good friend and she was so sociable. Uh, she would just be itching to get to something like that. So those things did not make sense. Yeah, so I remember Ursula used to flutter around. She used to sit underneath there sometimes and then she'd be over here. I think a thought that was running through all of our heads was, had she been taken by Ivan Malat, maybe she's been murdered. We had no idea. There was just hope that she was still out there. Thirty years, it was say thirty years. One, two, three. Thirty years. In all of our minds, Ursula's still seventeen. Ursula really loved that outdoors life. She was always the first one to do something and she was always brave and confident. Her mother, Cherie, and I parted when Ursula was quite young. And then Elizabeth and I married. We got to see quite a bit of her until we moved to the Central Coast. We have her for school holidays and then Andrew came along in 1980 and she was the first person we rang. And then along came Kate. The kids adored her and she adored the kids. When she was with us, she ruled our world. Like, I looked up to her so much. And when she was there, it was just, I loved it. I loved having a big sister because it was always fun. As Ursula became a teenager, I did notice some changes in her. She didn't know where she fitted and I think as part of living in a small country town, she was probably feeling stifled and wanting to go out and see the world. 
towards the middle of year 11, her risk taking became more extreme. Excessive drinking, passing out at parties, not knowing what was going on around her. Some small drugs, being a little bit promiscuous. It started a rumour mill which started off through the school but then went through the wider community and I think Ursula became quite scared, embarrassed, which made her act out even more. Cherie called me one night. She said, could you take Ursula for a while because I just can't handle it? And I said, of course. So uh, down she came. The last day that we saw Ursula was the uh, spring of 1987. She was in year 11 and didn't want to go any further. She basically said, well, I'm 17. I can leave home, I can do what I like. And she said, I found a job in Sydney. As parents, we accepted the fact that we had to let her go. My dad and Andrew and Kate took her to the train. It was the middle of the week. We were going down on the Saturday and it gave her two days to get organised and call us. She said, I'll contact you as soon as I'm where I am. That was the last thing she ever said to us. Each day went by and it got to be the two weeks and we thought we didn't think she would have left it that long to have made contact. I was becoming very anxious. So I went to Sydney where the police headquarters were and reported her as a full missing person with photographs. We just waited because we thought, well, they go and look. But I don't know, what we just thought that's what they did. There was no follow-up whatsoever from the police. Nobody was interviewed whatsoever, no friends, family or acquaintances. I actually felt that there was a lack of interest from the police, that she was just a, another runaway and that she'd come home. I guess we believed that there was nothing that you could do. You just had to wait at home and hope they turned up. It was, it was awful, awful. Before she was leaving, Ursula wrote a letter to me and a letter to our small group of friends. And she says, I'm pretty good, thanks. I'm having fun down on the coast. I'm down visiting my dad. How's school? I thought the police would come and get those letters from me, so I held on to them, but they never did. And she misses us all. That's three or four times through here. She's like, I miss you, can't wait to see you on her little cartoon, see soon. There was no indication at all that she wanted to just disappear. For a 17-year-old girl to run away, it always has surprised me that nobody came and spoke to us about what was going on in her life, what she was thinking, what she might have told any of us. With uh, no results from the police at all, we started to look ourselves. Wherever we went, we never stopped looking. Dad used to go down to Sydney a fair bit. I didn't realise what he was doing because obviously I was young. I didn't realise that he was going down to look. In the back of my mind at that stage, there was the chance that she had got involved with something that was sinister and couldn't get out. When you go looking in those places, you soon realise what sort of deviant people are around. And uh, it was pretty sad to see it all firsthand. It was like a slow burn. Christmas comes and she doesn't come home. You know, then birthdays come round and she doesn't get in touch. As years went by, we would often get a phone call to say that somebody had taken up her case, but then nothing would happen. It would just be a phone call. Ursula's mother, Cherie, passed away in 2004. And that was 17 years after Ursula disappeared and just before she passed. I said to her, I'm sure she's gone. And she said, I finally agree with you. She said, I'm on the way to meet her. That really kicked me. When Arnie Cherie died, then 
all the conversations about Ursula, you know, the memories we used to share, that all stopped. We just pretended that it wasn't happening. In 2008, uh, we had our 20th school reunion. We're all sitting there talking about Ursula. Surely somebody out there's got to know something about her, where she is. Facebook was so new and someone suggested that I put together a Facebook page, which I did. Andrew, who's Ursula's brother, he joined the Facebook page in 2010. I'd always wanted to be a policeman and always used to think, oh, once I'm there, I can then maybe do something. I can, just, I can, I can look for her. I made some inquiries with some people at the Missing Persons Unit. That's pretty much the first thing I did because it's the first thing I ever thought I could do. He was at the same station as the senior constable, Adam Marsh, and Adam was seconded to Missing Persons Unit, and Andrew actually said that his sister, Ursula, was missing. He goes, yeah, mate, if I, if I can, I'll have a look. Someone having a, a poke around is always handy. New forensic imaging technology is giving families of missing persons fresh hope of finding their loved ones. So in 2010, there was the campaign with the Australian Federal Police and the Missing Persons Unit. And that was to use the age progression technology, and I think it was the first time that that had been used. We really felt this was our last chance of maybe if she was alive, that, you know, surely somebody would see her. Federal Police have launched the first poster using sophisticated age-enhanced photos of long... I grew up thinking oh, it was just her, and then you start to realise that, wow, there is so many people that just go missing. I had friends calling me just saying, is that, that's your sister, she's on, the, she's on the bus stop. When I saw Ursula on the television, it concerned me that her hair colour was wrong, her eye colour was wrong, and the date she went missing was wrong. So I made phone call after phone call. It's at least three to four weeks incorrect. This is a really sloppy profile. And really, someone should do something about that because how are we gonna find her with information like this? As the time went by, nothing came of it, so it was basically then, ah, oh, okay, and we're back to square one. In 2014, there's a statewide initiative to follow up on stalled long-term missing person cases. At King's Cross, a detective by the name of Kurt Haywood ends up with Ursula Barwick's missing persons file. He said, and we thought this may have been a homicide, but he said, I think there's more in this story than what you and I can even envisage. Something's gone wrong somewhere. We were both interviewed. We hadn't been officially interviewed before by anybody. He got Sergeant Amy Scott on board as well, and he seemed to be doing more than anyone ever had. And they went all over Ursula's background. They went back to Grindai and to the high school and gathered little snippets of information. I think during my interview, Amy was very open about the fact that um, not much had ever been done, and she worked so hard. Um, every little name that I gave her that had a vague connection to Ursula's case, she followed up. Today, police released a reenactment of Ursula Barwick, who's been missing for 28 years. In 2015, we had the Missing Persons Week, and she was the face of that, and a lot of publicity went around with her face on it. She told her family that she'd just won a new job and she would ring her family with her new address so they could bring the remainder of her belongings down to her. The Barwicks are still waiting for that phone call. Ursula will turn 45 in less than two weeks' time, but in my mind and the minds of everyone who knows and loves Ursula, she is still 17. As a result of all the um, attention on Ursula during National Missing Persons Week, there was a call into Crime Stoppers. Almost three decades after Ursula Barwick went missing, police... There's fresh hope a woman who vanished from the Central Coast 30 years ago could still be alive. We've recently received new information that Ursula was in fact working at the Coach and Horses Hotel in Randwick in July of 1989. There was a sighting of Ursula in Sydney two years after she disappeared. Police have been able to verify... I was just stunned. It was like, oh, this is really, really good. But then it was a sad feeling as well because it was by choice that she didn't come home. Ursula, if you're out there anywhere, please contact us. 
just to know that you're okay, your life's okay, and the rest of it doesn't matter. But it turned out to be a mistaken identity of a Corindai girl, very similar in stature, and was going to university down there. About six months later, in May 2016, I got a call late in the afternoon from Kurt. He said, I've got a set of photographs I want you to look at. Now he said, it's going to be very hard on you, but I want you to look at every one of them. I think that this may be the end of your case. They showed us a report of a young girl who had died in an accident in 1987 and she went under the name of Jessica or Jessie and we, reading it, were wondering what did this have to do with us. I thought, oh my God, Father, this is a bit horrific. But then I looked closer. Her eyes and her teeth was Ursula. Her hair was it, her body was, it was like, I can't see her face, but that's her. I got up, I went and sat on the end of the bed. I couldn't handle it. It's been so long, so hard. And there it was, sitting in front of me. It was only then that we found out how much investigation went into finding these photos and the background of how it all came about. The reason why the detectives at King's Cross had these photographs was because of Senior Constable Adam Marsh. Adam was the former work colleague of Ursula's brother, Andrew Barwick. We now know that it was five years earlier at the missing persons unit that Adam Marsh was reviewing a file involving a young girl who died in a car crash. He started to notice striking similarities between that file and the case of Ursula Barwick. He was particularly struck by the photographs. Five months after the crash, a friend identified this victim in the morgue as Jessica Pierce but he couldn't find any trace of this mystery friend. While Adam Marsh had his suspicions that this victim could be Ursula Barwick, he couldn't prove it. We now know that his concerns were dismissed by his superiors and he didn't mention anything to Ursula's family. Fast forward to 2015 and Adam Marsh saw something that absolutely convinced him Ursula Barwick was in fact Jessica Pearce. Well, it is the start of National Missing Persons Week and police... Ursula Barwick, who has been... When we had the Missing Persons Week, back in 2015, Adam saw a different photo of Ursula, a different one to the one he had been looking at in 2010, 2011, and he said he had chills down his spine because he thought, it is her. At this time, he's no longer with Missing Persons. This is just him doing it because he remembers my name and he remembers me. And that tiny little thing went to Kurt and Amy and then all of a sudden, it just, it just took off. When we found out that Adam had made a connection five years earlier between Jessica and Ursula, and he, he was discouraged to go ahead, it was like, why didn't they let him go ahead with it when he had such a strong feeling? The question of why Adam Marsh wasn't allowed to pursue his hunch is one of the most baffling aspects of this case. Years on, we still don't have an answer as to why he wasn't allowed to investigate that link any further. After we identified that it was Ursula in the photos and we were sure of it, the police still had to go about proving 100% that it was her. And so they began by finding the other three guys in the car. Kurt contacted me just asking me if I remembered, mostly if I remembered what happened in the, in the accident and do I remember Jess? And of course I did. I first met Jess World in King's Cross. Mark and Rob, myself, Jess, a few other girls, a few other guys, we all hung around up the cross. 
I met um, Jess in a pool hall, which just used to be across the road in the orange doorway. We used to come up here and play pool and just muck around, listen to music. Jess just came out of the blue. You know, she was a real spark. Very innocent compared to us. Like, we were just a bit dead set bunch of mugs. I'd never heard of the name Ursula before. I only knew her as Jess and her boyfriend. I think it was Mark. We knew she wasn't from around here, just the way she was dressed. Um, denim jacket, denim jeans, white shirt. Jess or Ursula had been in King's Cross for about three weeks when Hans, as he told police, decided to steal a car. And we went driving around. They said they'd stolen the car and that they were going to Melbourne and did we want to come? And, and I knew at the time my dad would kill me if I left. Jess decided to come with us because Mark was going. Mark was the one showing me around Melbourne and she weren't letting him go nowhere without her. I was driving initially. We pulled up down around Yass, I suppose, and that's when Robert took over. I straight out said to him, you do not use the cruise control. And I've gone off and done my own thing, gone to sleep, etc. Jess and Mark, they've laid down on the back seat cuddling, you know, and gone to sleep. That's exactly what he did. Set the cruise control at 120 kilometres an hour. And we ended up going head on with a truck at that speed. It was four teenagers going on a joyride and we don't feel any animosity towards them. It could have been anyone driving that car. It was just an accident. And the sad part about it was it happened three weeks after she disappeared. She wasn't a prostitute and she wasn't taking drugs. She was just there being part of the, the gang. I guess a car accident was much better than what we all thought. Um, because you do start to think the worst. But then, as much as that was a relief, the frustration started kicking in as to, well, why wasn't there any answers? Or well, how did this go so wrong for so many years? After the crash in 1987, we've got two separate investigations going on at the same time, but no one has joined the dots. She didn't have a licence, no mobile phones, no ID. The other boys just said they know her as Jessie. They couldn't give her a last name or anything like that. It was just Jessie. Through the letters that Ursula had written to Melissa, she had made mention that if in the future she'd ever have a daughter, she would name her Jessica. She changed her name to the name she would have given her future daughter. Police investigating that crash we're only looking for a woman named Jessica. He has stated there were a large number of inquiries made in relation to attempting to locate relatives of the deceased. Around the same time, we've got Ursula's family who report her missing. They weren't looking at missing person records for young women, say, aged between 16 and 25, or flicking through the photographs of uh, recently reported missing women as well. He could have just easily found missing the missing person. persons report yep. if, if he, you know, exhausted all inquiries to do that. In missing person investigations, it seems like the obvious place to look would be the morgue, but police didn't check against bodies that turned up over the past few months. When we found out that Ursula had laid in the morgue in Glebe for 15 months and nothing or nobody went to look at it or to, to even explain or do anything like that, we were bitterly disappointed. The problem is you've got New South Wales Health that looks after the morgue. Then you've got New South Wales Police that's in charge of the investigation. They all have different records and databases and systems that aren't talking to each other. And this is an issue that's carried on throughout the decades and something that police are still grappling with now. In 2014, 
I was asked to uh, conduct a review of missing persons unit for the New South Wales Police. From my review, there was failures at every level. The intake of the police report, the level of care that is shown when someone first reports. There were wrong date of births, wrong genders, wrong addresses, wrong next of kin. What essentially occurs is we get dirty data. Probably the thing that shocked me the most was what was happening in the morgue, where there were so many unidentified bodies. These could be some of our long-term missing persons. When you have an unidentified body turn up, it's not automatically matching against a missing persons report that's made at the same time. Right, I'm just about ready. Once the detectives wrapped up their investigation, we knew it had to go to the coroner's court to have Jessica officially declared as Ursula Diane Barwick. Here we go. Morning of the inquest, I had the jitters. Because <laughs> you think, oh, God, what's going to happen now? There's something going to go wrong. Morning. Morning. Kurt and Amy aren't allowed to comment as yet because there is still a process of the inquest still happening but they were with us that day. They were such a great help to us and always supported us too. And we can't thank them enough. It was their work that got us there. How are you feeling? How's the feeling? Oh, oh. It's, a bit, it's a bit surreal, Kurt. Yeah. Kurt and Amy, definitely they've formed a very strong bond with my mum and dad. I'm so appreciative of, of the way it has worked out for them. That's the best part about it. They did an amazing job for them and they just become such good friends out of it. Ursula is buried at the Emu Plain Cemetery. They don't know whereabouts in that cemetery because there were no records and there is no headstone. We've just got a plaque on this wall that's down there. That's as much as we could do to say goodbye. There is a second inquest coming up in 2020 that will focus on the Ursula Barwick investigation, where the shortfalls were and why she wasn't identified so much sooner. I suggest that the coroner will find systemic issues with the investigation and failure on the side of the New South Wales Police, without a doubt. We will never, ever know for sure. No. That's just the sad thing. Mm -hmm. you never, ever know for sure. There is nothing that you can do as a family member of a missing persons that makes police follow their standard operating procedures or take action. I would love a legal duty of care placed upon the police to investigate. Then police can be held liable personally. That will make police do their job. When we had the, the memorial for Ursula, because there'd been nothing done, I just thought to myself, there was a lot of other people who would have been touched if she had survived. There was a lot of bad luck involved, even in finding her. But I think that she would be extremely happy that we did find her, and I think that she would have been overjoyed to see us there that day. It seems quite unbelievable that, that it could actually happen, but it has happened, so what can we learn from it? And that's Ursula's legacy. It's never too late to find your missing person. <laughs>